Nikolai Faust is a world leading scholar in management research. His scientific contributions are many, they're important, and they're highly cited. In short, Nikolai Faust is one of the most influential researchers in our field. Now, rather than spending the next hour elaborating on his exceptional achievements, I think time is better spent giving the word to uh, Professor Foss. So with these words, Nikolai, take it away. I will, I shall, thank you. Uh, let's see, is the slide deck watchable? Can you see it? Yes. So it's perfect, yeah. Nikolai. So it seems to work. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for attending. Uh, Torbjörn advised me to speak about a theme with some interdisciplinary content. Uh, and I think collective motivation is exactly such a concept or theme. And furthermore, it also has some implications, some interesting implications potentially for the difficulty that we often face when we uh, try to pull off on interdisciplinary undertakings. We can get back to that later, but let me uh, say a few more words about myself in the light of the uh, interdisciplinary uh, ambitions of DS. Uh, so as Torbjörn already, already said, uh, I'm a management professor, which means that interdisciplinarity is almost guaranteed for better or for worse. Uh, most of my work has taken place within the uh, strongly related fields of strategy, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And I've do done most of my research fundamentally from an economics background, because this is how I was educated. I guess my uh, economics colleagues may not think that I'm much of an economist anymore, but you know, this is a starting point. This is what shapes my thinking. Uh, and uh, you know, this, this frames how my first take on phenomena that I'm interested in. But I've also, partly as a result from being in a business school, realized that in order to understand all the subtleties of many sub uh, phenomena, you also need to draw on ideas and insights from other fields and disciplines, and I'm most happy to do so. So over the last 10 years or so, I mainly uh, researched the, the three themes you see on this slide. And the first theme is innovation. And with, uh, an employee of University of Southern Denmark who is present for this talk, Jakob Lucy, Professor Jakob Lucy. Uh, I have looked in particular at the role of firms' organizational designs with respect to shaping the processes and outcomes of innovation. And Jakob and I have also looked at how the characteristics of managers and employees influence innovation processes and innovation outcomes. This is a, a wholly empirical undertaking based on registered data from and survey data from Denmark. My second big theme is entrepreneurship, where I have two sub themes. So I looked at foundational issues. What do we actually mean by entrepreneurship? How can we best conceptualize it? How can we model it? And so on. And then I have a huge empirical sub uh, theme under entrepreneurship, with, where with Professor Jakob, uh, sorry, um, Christian Bjornskov from the University of Aarhus. We look at the role of institutions in shaping entrepreneurship and shaping how entrepreneurship contributes to macro outcomes such as economic growth. The third big uh, theme that I pursued over the last 10, 15 years is micro foundations of management research, which is fundamentally about how we can refine, uh, systematize, expand how we think about the rationality and the motivation of human actors not for its own sake, but in order to generate new insight in organization and strategy. And this is exactly what I'm going to talk about today. Um, because I'll, I'm, as announced, I'll be talking about collective motivation. And here's a first working definition of what we may mean by collective motivation. So collective motivation means being motivated to choose your actions in terms of the goals of some collective entity, which can be a family or an organization or university or perhaps even conceivably a nation, so as to reach a desired outcome, an outcome that is not just desired for you yourself, but also for other members of the same co uh, social collectivity. And it's, I guess, intuitive to see the, the contemporary relevance of this basic notion of 
collective motivation because we are at the University of Southern Denmark now, at least virtually. Uh, and you have apparently adopted, or we have apparently adopted, I should say, because I'm adjunct, the UN Sustainable Development Goals as university goals. And I take it that this means that from the point of view of university leadership, it's desirable that members of the University of Southern Denmark organization are motivated to choose behaviors that relate to teaching and research in terms of those overall development goals. You also, it, it has not escaped your attention that we're in the midst of a pandemic. And you have noticed that of course, decision makers, politicians see it as a desirable that we choose our behaviors in such a way that they serve overall goals of say, reducing infection risks during the pandemic. Now, many of these things, many of these desirable behaviors can be called forth by means of policies, or if, you're in, if we are in organizations by means of rewards and incentives, but because not all behaviors can be inspected, policed, monitored, enforced, sanctioned, and so on, for reasons of asymmetric information, we cannot survey all behaviors in society or all behaviors in organizations, we will ultimately, to some extent, need to fall back to an element of collective motivation. But here's a basic conjecture, namely that all social groups have, perhaps to varying degrees, but all social groups or collective entities have to rely on collective motivation for their efficient functioning. Again, for the reason that not everything can be observed, monitored, enforced, policed, or even influenced by norms or contracts, procedures, or other institutions. And this basic conjecture applies to organizations. So I'll, I'll argue that collective ma motivation matters importantly and fundamentally to our understanding of organizations as fundamentally collaborative entities, collections of people that collaborate to reach uh, a given goal or end. And I'll try to sketch uh, the foundations of a research program, which is now one decade old, which is based on exactly this notion that collective motivation matters importantly to our understanding of organizations as collaborative entities. And the, the origins, or part of the origins of this research program is, among other things, this article by my frequent collaborator, Sigvard Lindenberg, called The Spreading of Disorder, in which they experimentally uh, uh, explore or investigate the so-called broken windows theory, the idea that if you're in a given neighborhood with lots of graffiti, broken windows and so on, you are somehow cued or primed to engage in similar, less lawful activities. And they show experimentally that with some very simple and neat, but neat experiments that there's actually something to this. And they reason again that these broken windows, gravity and so on, they function as cues uh, that make you frame social situations in a particular way and adopt particular goals of behaving in that particular social situation. So this insight is pretty much the beginning of it all. But I want to start somewhere else. I want to start with uh, a guy who was very famous in the interwar period, but probably forgotten today. But he coined a great aphorism, namely this one. Men will work hard for money. They will work hard for other men, but men will work hardest of all when they're dedicated to a course. Men will work hardest of all when they're dedicated to a course, like perhaps these guys. So these are West Point cadets on graduation day. And these are one hope, one hopes, and one surmises. These are men who are dedicated to a course, namely the course of US foreign policy and the goals this implies, of course. These are not only men who are committed to a course, but also men who share an identity. And of course, it's a very good idea to have the men who are committed to a course on our behalf share at an identity. An identity which is very neatly illustrated here by their uniforms, of course, which are exactly identical. And why are we interested in identity in this context? We're interested in identity because identity has motivational force. 
This is one way of thinking about this. So now we move a little bit to economics. So the way an econo economist might reason about this is to start as usual with assuming that we pursue utility and we want to maximize utility as actors. And as usual, we have uh, we derive positive utility from income. This is why. And we derive negative utility from the effort that we have to expend. This is E. But then there's C. This is uh, this stands for social category. And the claim here is that these guys here quite literally derive utility from belonging to this particular uh, collective entity that they are members of. They are West Point cadets and future officers in the US military. And that is a distinct source of utility. Furthermore, we can specify that when you are, have this identity of being, say, a West Point cadet, there are certain things you're supposed to do. Uh, perhaps certain things you're supposed to believe even, and certain things you're not supposed to do, and certain things you're not supposed to believe, and so on. This is E asterisk in the little notation up here. And what the E asterisk minus E means is that once you diverge from the ideal, I'd call it effort level here, for the given social category, there is negative, so there's negative perceived utility. Of course, as a utility maximizing agent, you want to avoid having your utility reduced. So that's the motivational force of identity, belonging to a certain social category and having and sharing an identity with other members of the same uh, social category means that you're incentivized literally to do similar things to the other guys in the same um, social category. Now that's just a way, a way of putting identity into some very basic economics uh, notation. But it doesn't, doesn't really tell us why in the first place there is such a thing as say identity utility, where does it come from? And then we can turn sociologists and we can say it's probably socially constructed or through historical processes or, or whatnot. But we can also go naturalists and speculate that perhaps we are hardwired with a need for belonging to social uh, groups, to, uh, to what I hear called social categories. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this book by Jonathan Haidt. It's a great book that I really recommend. It's called The Righteous Mind. This is, you see, to the right, you see the front page of the cover of the European edition. This is what it looked like in the American edition, slightly different. Let's go back to the European one since we're in Europe. But in this book, uh, Haidt uh, talks about something he calls the hive switch. And he has this nice passage where it says that we human beings are conditional hive creatures. We want to belong to the hive given certain conditions. And that means we have the ability under special conditions to transcend self-interest. And it says, lose ourselves temporarily and ecstatically in something larger than ourselves. And he offers a bunch of categories, things like Dionysiac parties or celebrations, festivities, and its modern equivalent, the rave. But I think Hyde in that book could have chosen much more mundane examples to illustrate the basic point. He could have chosen, say, a family. So there's a picture of a presumably well-functioning, happy family doing a walk in the woods. Mom, dad, two kids. Now, if you think about the situation as a member, if, if, if you're in the situation and you're a parent, say, and many of you, you've been there, this might be how you think about it. So you say to yourself, well, we as a group, as this social entity called the family, we have certain preferences for walk in the woods. We recognize this collective endeavor and we want to realize a mutual advantage. It's good for the family, in other words, it's good for us. So that means that we choose and should choose our actions, our plans in terms of the family's goals, including helping other family members, prodding them if they stray from the path in the woods or something like that. And I think this is not necessarily a matter of having identical preferences doesn't mean that we somehow become one and the same in some mystical way, but it means that we adopt a we point of view 
where it's meaningful to talk about what we should do that helps us as a group, as a social entity. And I think this is really mundane and I think it's non-controversial, but it's not something, it's not a way of thinking that you'll see reflected in what I think are the most sophisticated tools we have for thinking about action and social interaction, namely rational choice theory and game theory. Because in all these tools, the basic perspective is not what we should do, it is what I should do. It's utterly individualistic. So we can move from the family um, to organizations and perhaps the equivalent in organizations are teams. So what are teams? Well, teams are groups of individuals that seek to achieve a joint goal under conditions of input interdependency. They know that what I do depends on what the other guys in the team are doing and so on. And economists have traditionally been suspicious of teams, I think it's fair to say, because of the obvious problem of free riding in teams, as illustrated by this meme, which you might have seen uh, somewhere on the, on the internet. This, this is a basic illustration of the free riding problem in teams, right? But of course, there's, there's evidence to um, support the, the phenomenon of free riding in teams, some of it very, very old. This is an old experiment carried out in 1913 by Engelmann. And he carried out a very, very simple experiment because he had guys pulling a rope to lift a weight. And to the, uh, what, it, what he did was he varied the number of rope pullers. You can see that in the uh, extreme left-hand column. So he varied the number all the way up to eight. And if you look at the column to the extreme right, you can see that the increments, the added weight per rope puller declines uh, systematically until the eight rope puller is reached and there's an increment of exactly zero. And since this is a very simple task, it's not credible to ascribe this um, declining increment in terms of coordination problems. It has to do with problems of free riding most credibly. So these, this kind of evidence and thinking about the team problem has made, made uh, economists traditionally suspicious of teams. But then on the other hand, if teams are really that beset with free riding, free riding problems, the very widespread use of teams and team rewards seems very puzzling indeed. Of course, the economics answer is that, well, this is the basic reason why we are firms. Firms are social entities that are specialized in dealing with the free riding problem that comes up in connection with production in teams. But again, a more naturalistic answer or way of looking at it is actually possible. Because we know for, for, from the literature around the social brain hypothesis that it seems like a very reasonable hypothesis that evolution has made our cognitive and our motivational apparatus predisposed to deal with team situations and therefore also the team or free riding problem. So this broad literature suggests that our brain, our social brain is literally hardwired to perceive, perceive those situations that require team effort, allocate roles and responsibilities perhaps even including allocating authority, and also engage in behaviors that are aimed at helping, prodding, and motivating other members of the team, all in order to make common cause, all in order to reach the goal of the team. Uh, so given that if, or if it is in fact the, the case that evolution has hardwired our brains to deal with, with situations uh, in this, with team situations in this manner. It's probably something spontaneous, unconscious, it just happens more or less automatically. Still, we can think in a more rational way about um, what goes on, what we can try to reconstruct what goes on here in terms of reasoning the reasoning processes that we can imagine team members going through when they choose the actions in terms of the goals 
of the social collective, or in this case, the team. So it could be something like this. I'm a member of the group or the team S. Second step, I know that it's common knowledge in the group that every member of the group identifies with the group. It's also common knowledge in the group that every member of the group wants us to achieve our goals. In this case, we want to maximize some objective function. And finally, we know, we all know, and we all know that we have, and everyone knows that there is a profile of actions or strategies that uniquely maximizes the objective function, you. Therefore, therefore, I should choose my components of the action profile. I should do my part of the joint effort so that, the, that we can reach our joint goals. Now, this, this way of thinking is, as I indicated earlier, not one that is prevalent in rational choice theory and in game theory. So it's not easy to, to uh, see how you would express it game theoretically, but it could perhaps look something like this. So to the left, you have a game written in the traditional way. Uh, so I, I, as player A, I seek to maximize my utility, my payoffs. Uh, and uh, if I know that if I play 10 and the other player, uh, sorry, if I play left and the other player also plays left, we're both left with 10. But the point is, I try to maximize my payoffs given what the other player is doing. And that, of course, is the traditional individualistic starting point of game theory, what philosophers call I intentions. I uh, pursue my own intentions rather than the intentions that you may, at least metaphorically, ascribe to the group. So how could we, uh, how could we represent that? How can we represent we intentions? Well, perhaps we can represent it in terms of the game, the derived game to the right, where we uh, both me as A and the other player B seek to maximize the objective function of us, of the group, of the team, of the collectivity. So we choose both to play right. And this has a number of advantages, solves, may potentially solve some deep problems in game theory, the foundations of game theory. It has to do with showing, demonstrating in a logically valid way how players can actually reason their way to the best outcomes, because that isn't simple at all, it has turned out. It's simpler if players adopt we intentions, and it makes it easier for players to coordinate on the preferred outcomes, what economists or game theorists might call the Pareto frontier. And it may also help us deal with some puzzles in experimental game theory. Why is it that so many people choose to cooperate in the one-shot prisoner's dilemma game? Okay, um, so it's, it's it, so far. It's, I, I basically said that if we can make pe make people be motivated in this collective way, it may be highly desirable. But what does it require? Again, it requires that we are capable of recognizing and understand a joint endeavor of some kind, such as uh, production in a team. It requires that we are capable of seeing ourselves as part of this endeavor. It requires that we are capable of cognitively co coordinating our cooperation, that we can see what is the best division of labor and allocate roles and responsibilities within the social collective. And it requires, of course, and this is the motivational part, that we actually choose our behaviors in terms of the joint goals of the collectivity. Uh, and this all sounds very nice, uh, but how is it done? How is it done? And this is something that, again, has puzzled people like John Ledyard. So Ledyard is a leader in experimental game theory, and he's been particularly taken up with experimentally examining so-called public goods games, where there is always the risk of free riding. And Ledyard concludes in one of his papers that Based on the many experiments we've done so far, it's possible to provide an environment in which almost all of the subjects actually contribute toward the group interests. And then it says very tellingly 
why this all works remains a mystery. And of course, it's mysterious if your starting point is, is in economics or in game theory, because I mean, you're faced with a problem of free riding. And of course, uh, an evolutionary biologist may raise the same concern, because from the evolutionary perspective, it seems likely that individual concerns have an adaptive advantage over the concerns of the group, right? Which is a traditional critique of group selection. But there's a further pro problem which Ledyard points to in his paper, namely the decay problem. Namely that these experiments pretty uniformly shows that the motivation to contribute to the group decays over time if it's not explicitly supported somehow. So how can, how can collective motivation be supported? How is it done? How can it be done in organizations? Uh, here we may turn to uh, social psychology and the so-called new look in social psychology research on motivation. Because this so-called new look highlights that cognition and motivation do not exist in separate analytical boxes, but are on the contrary, highly intertwined. And one implication of the new look is that if you want to manage motivation or motivations, you have to manage cognitive processes. There's a little illustration of that. This is um, an experiment by Lieberman and colleagues about this back in 2004. And what they did was to expose subjects to the same prisoner's dilemma game, but labeled differently. So in one treatment, this prisoner's dilemma game was called the Wall Street game. Guys, you're about to play the Wall Street game. Different treatment, it was called the community game. You're about to play the community game. Please play. And what Lieberman and his colleagues found was that the defection rates differ dramatically depending on labeling. And this is, reason, this is interesting because, well, first of all, this runs totally counter to everything that game theory tells us, because game theory tells us that labeling doesn't matter. All that matters are the, you know, the payoffs and the strategies and so on, not how that game is labeled. But it did matter, did matter a great deal in these experiments. And the second implication is, of course, that this exemplifies what I just said, that managing motivation is, to a large extent, a matter of managing cognition. Because when you present the, pay, the game as either the Wall Street game or the community game, obviously what you do is you manipulate people's cognition by giving them certain cues. Cues that activate certain goals, such as the overarching goal to improve your status position or your, your gain. So if you cue them with the Wall Street label, but you activate the gain goal. If you cue them with the, sorry, the community label, you activate another goal. You activate the over, overarching goal of perhaps behaving appropriately, say. So it matters. So the implication of this line of reasoning is that when goals become focal, uh, they're induced by or primed by cues, they frame a situation. They frame a social situation in the sense that they, uh, they condition what you attempt to, what knowledge you activate, what alternatives you consider, how you weigh them, what you see as the cost and benefits associated with different alternatives, and so on. And there may be many of these kinds of overarching goals, but for the purpose of thinking about action in organizations, at least three kinds of goals are salient, important. Because there's a hedonic goal, which are the, the goals that um, are about improving how you feel right now. Perhaps you've already had enough of my babbling and you may want to leave uh, the Zoom meeting. So you may give in to some short-term emotions. And of course, this is a strong goal because it is tied to the emotions. But you may also be in a different goal frame. You may actually believe 
that listening to fast talking about social psychology and other research could improve uh, well, parts of your research considerably, which could be good for your long-term career. And if that's how you think, then you are in the gain goal frame, which is about improving one's wealth, including status and position and so on. So wealth in a very broad sense. And of course, this is the goal that economics focuses on. And then of course, you may also be here and listen because you are in the normative goal frame, which is about acting appropriately. This is what I ought to do as a member of DSA. Now, the normative goal isn't really about rigid norm following per se, but it is about choosing behaviors that serve joint goals, such as the goals of DS in this example. So this, as you can hear, this is the goal or goal frame that supports collective motivation. Uh, so this is, in, in, from, in, for many purposes, for many activities and organizations, this is the goal in, this is the goal that you want to be dominant. The problem is that this particular goal is the weakest one. It's the one that is susceptible to free riding, for example, and it will be displaced by other goals, provided it isn't supported by what I've here called flanking arrangements or supporting arrangements, if you like. What are these flanking arrangements? Well, they may be things that like rewards that stress your contributions to join goals. So um, a professor in a university, according to this line of reasoning, shouldn't really be rewarded for improving his research performance per se. He or she should be awarded for publishing research that supports the aims and the goals of the collective of the university. We should have a task structure which is transparent so that we can all see our place in the joint production and how we contribute and what it means what we contribute. It may be a good idea to have pro-social goals at the organizational level. So when University of Southern Denmark adopts the UN goals as university goals, that may actually have uh, positive beneficial effects on employee motivation lower down in the system. There should be an emphasis on professionalism because professionalism is often very much about doing what is good for the collective and so on. So you can hear that these ideas have potential applications, in fact, many potential applications to the life of organizations. And in this uh, research program, which Lindenberg and I have unfolded over the last decade, we have looked at traditional strategy issues like how can firms best create economic value. We have looked at how collective motivation influences the way you organize firms. We have looked at leadership implications. We have looked at corporate social responsibility. We've looked at ethics and other things. So I think this is a fruitful and generative research program, but it's also a research program with a lot of open issues. And one of these open issues is what you might call the scope of collective motivation. So um, a pertinent question uh, in this question, in this context is, is there something like a Dunbar number for collective motivation? So the Dunbar number, as you know, this is, a number that supposedly is an estimate of the number of relatively close social relationships that we can cognitively handle. And people say this is maybe around 150, uh, at least between 100 and 200. So uh, along this line of reasoning, could it be that there is a limit to uh, how thin uh, we, can, we can spread collective motivation? Is this something it can only truly arise in relatively small social groups, for example. Also, how stable is collective motivation over time? How fast does it tend to decay? And how is this influenced by, for example, the kind of organization that uh, is able to mobilize this kind of motivation? How is it best called forth? How is it best stabilized over time? Uh, and these are questions that I think we cannot really address without going much more empirical 
than we have done so far in this program. Because if truth be told, we have a lot of indirect evidence, notably from social psychology, but we have very little evidence that directly speaks to these applications of the notion of collective motivation. And this is because we still don't have good scales, we don't, still don't have good measurement, we still don't have uh, experiments. So again, there are few uh, distinct empirically supported predictions from this line of research. I think I went a little bit over time, but uh, I'll, I'll stop here.